For today's video, our favourite space denier, Level Earth Observer, thinks he's figured something out. And it's so hilarious, I simply had to show you. You can't miss this one, people. Roll the titles. Hello all and welcome along to another video with me, Simon Dan. Thanks very much for joining me. Before we begin with today's video, a huge thank you to the sponsors today, Incogni. The number of data breaches around the world rises each year. According to the annual data breach report by the Identity Theft Resource Centre, it went up by 72% in 2023 compared to previous years. This means that you and your loved ones are at a constantly increasing risk of data breaches, as a growing list of data brokers holds your personal information. Now, whilst you can ask those data brokers to delete your personal information, the process takes hundreds of hours to do manually and requires repetition. That is why you need Incogni. Incogni reaches out to data brokers on your behalf, requests your personal data removal, and then handles any objections from their side. And the whole process is automated. They also make sure that your data stays off the market by conducting repeated removals, taking your data down if it pops up again. And that's what makes their yearly subscription especially advantageous. You can also protect your loved ones too with a family and friends plan. You can add up to four members to your subscription, meaning they benefit from the exact same service that you do. I've been in using Incogni for over 18 months now, and in the last report, I had 152 requests for data removal. That is a massive amount, and it saved me 114 hours of work. And now introducing custom removals on the Incogni Unlimited plan. If you try Googling yourself, full name, city, state, etc., you'll be shocked at how many sites publicly share your information. But Incogni's custom removals can put a stop to that. You simply point them to where your data is being exposed, and their privacy experts will handle the rest. Whilst it may seem like taking your personal data back is challenging, their custom removals features makes it effortless for you. Take your personal data back with Incogni, use the code at the link below and get 60% off the annual plan. That's at incogni.com slash Simandan. Right, on with today's video then, which comes from Level Earth Observer. He wants to talk about the space shuttle where he thinks he's figured out exactly what it is. Let's see where this goes. A funny thing happened on the way to space. Now I say space very loosely. Today, I'm going to show you what I think the space shuttle actually was. But before I do that, we've got to strip the space shuttle bare and expose it for all to see. And it's going to make it easy and obvious even for space fans to see. Let's just highlight something before he starts properly. The space shuttle flew 135 missions. It put the Hubble telescope in orbit, built most of the International Space Station, and ferried astronauts into low Earth orbit for decades. Whatever he has up his sleeve, it better be good. Very good. I'm going to show you how silly the space shuttle program was. I'm going to use footage from the very first ever space shuttle mission, STS-1. We join the action as the Space Shuttle is supposedly doing 17,500 miles an hour around the globe Earth. They've just opened their cargo doors and they're about to do an inspection. So let's have a look. Okay, we, uh, we want to show you all, uh, dear, we do have a, uh, a few tiles missing off of, uh, of both of them, uh, off of the uh, starboard pod. So that's not good. As you can see, several of the tiles, the heat tiles, which protect the space shuttle against extreme temperatures during re-entry, several of those tiles are actually missing. Yeah, really not good and quite revealing. Let's remember here, this is STS-1, the first space shuttle mission. Yes, some heat shield tiles were found to be missing during this mission, but that's just how test flights work by finding things like this. The entire point of STS-1 was to identify these types of issues, and they did, openly. And this is where it starts to get sillier and sillier. I'm over at Google. How are the space shuttle tiles attached? The tiles were not mechanically fastened to the vehicle, but glued. Since the brittle tiles could not flex with the underlying vehicle skin, 
They were glued to Nomex felt strain isolation pads with room temperature vulcanizing silicon adhesive, which in turn glued to the orbiter's skin. So essentially, that's a lot of fancy names to describe essentially these tiles were glued to the orbiter. Oh dear. Yes, the space shuttle tiles were glued on. We're talking about a very specific engineering solution here to a very specific problem. How to attach brittle heat resistant tiles to a flexible metal structure that expands and contracts due to temperature changes. Those strain isolation pads that he mentioned are soft felt like materials and they absorbed the movement of the shuttle's aluminium frame, which expanded and contracted during the flight. The entire system was designed so the rigid tiles wouldn't crack under pressure. The aluminum skin will melt at 320 degrees. The silicate tiles must insulate the vehicle from the tremendous heat. So the aluminium skin that's underneath these tiles will melt when it's exposed to temperatures greater than 320 degrees. And that's a major problem when we're looking at this old school footage from STS-1. Because essentially, we've now got parts of the space shuttle that are exposed. They're weak links in the chain, if you like. Where well, we've got the aluminium skin not protected by a heat tile. In the case of STS-1, these missing tiles were not in a high heat zone. They weren't on the underside of the nose, which bear the brunt of the re-entry heating. They were on the orbital maneuvering system pods. Now that's an area near the back of the shuttle which experiences far less heat stress. That's why the mission could continue and land safely. Now every tile wasn't equal in function either. Some areas required the high density black tiles, whilst others used the white tiles, or even reinforced carbon-carbon panels. And this is where the heat load were the highest, like the nose cone and the leading edge of the wings. What makes it worse now, the temperatures during re-entry, NASA have told us it's around about 3000 degrees, which would be terrible for this situation which we see on our screen right now. Yes, but that 3000 degrees is concentrated on specific aerodynamic surfaces, mainly the nose cone and the leading edge of the wings, as I said. And that's where the compression of the atmospheric gases is the most intense during re-entry. So the situation on our screen that he's talking about, where a few tiles are missing on non-critical areas, doesn't mean the entire shuttle is about to melt. These are minor surface losses on areas that never reach peak temperatures. But they're ranging from anything from 3000 degrees from NASA, all the way up to 9,000 degrees from a NASA legend, a space shuttle legend, who Gibson, who had this to say about temperatures regarding re-entry. Start hitting the Earth's atmosphere because you'll start to see a little bit of a glow outside your window. It's white hot outside. It's just as bright as that. And here outside is 9,000 degrees. Well, that's hotter than the surface of the sun. When the shuttle hits the upper atmosphere at orbital velocity, it compresses the air in front of it, as we said. And that compressed air forms a shockwave, a superheated plasma sheath, if you will, where temperatures can exceed 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. But that heat doesn't directly transfer to the shuttle's surface. The orbiter is protected by a boundary layer of slower moving gas, the thermal insulation and the heat tiles too. So whilst the air outside may reach 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit, the shuttle's surface itself doesn't get close to that temperature. Just think about it logically. If this thing was coming back in at 17,500 miles an hour, yeah? The moment it hit the Earth's atmosphere and started to feel resistance from the air, and of course friction and of course high temperatures, the lack of aerodynamics here due to the missing tiles would cause serious problems. The glue would fail, the aluminium skin would melt underneath the tiles that are not even there. The air, the air, the hot air would get underneath these tiles here and rip them off, exposing more of the aluminium skin and this air, aircraft would just disintegrate. Level Earth Observer everyone, our resident flight engineer. Look, the temperature around those pods at the back of the shuttle during re-entry was actually under 1000 degrees Fahrenheit. The damage noted on the STS-1 was on those pods, not on the nose or the fuselage bottom. NASA thoroughly inspected those areas, 
during orbit and cleared the shuttle for safe re-entry. Post-landing analysis confirmed their risk assessment was correct. No overheating occurred in the damage zones. That's at 3,000 degrees, yet alone the 9,000, who was on about? Doesn't matter who's right, whether it's NASA or the NASA legend. Coming back in at 17,500 miles an hour, hit an atmosphere, these tiles would be ripped off the back, the temperatures would just melt the aluminium skin. This thing would have essentially just been burnt to pieces. And that did happen to the Space Shuttle once, Columbia, in 2003. But that was not due to glue failure or tile weakness, or the re-entry temperatures being too hot. What happened was foam insulation broke off during the launch of the shuttle, striking the left wing's front edge, and damaged a section of the reinforced carbon-carbon tiles. Those were critical. It protected the wing's edge, where temperatures reached over 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Without it, that area was completely exposed. Now, Columbia proves the difference between cosmetic or non-critical tile loss like in STS-1 and catastrophic damage to critical heat shielding. For anyone claiming, oh, they fixed it before they returned. No. So I'm over at NASA STS-1, touchdown, landing the first space shuttle mission. We get an image here. I'm just going to nip into the image. When I zoom in, we can see the tiles haven't been replaced. Nope, and I wouldn't have said they were anyway. Which means this space shuttle didn't come back from space doing 17,500 miles an hour, hit a globe Earth atmosphere, encountered temperatures ranging from 3,000 to 9,000 degrees. No, 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 didn't encounter any of that or do any of that because it would have actually ripped up and burnt up and been absolutely obliterated upon re entry. The aluminium skin that was under the tiles that had fallen away would have been exposed to ridiculous temperatures and the spacecraft due to a failure of aerodynamics and a failure of space heat protection would have failed and been destroyed upon re-entry. But strangely enough it had no problems landing which means it didn't encounter the things they said it did. Just highlighting yet again the fraud that is this space shuttle program. They can't get their story straight. The reason they can't is because it's lies. Okay, thanks for that comprehensive explanation of what would happen in your world, Level Earth Observer, where everything you say is correct and physics don't matter. Now let's see what Level Earth Observer thinks that the space shuttle really is. So this, in my opinion, is how they got away with the space shuttle fraud. One, a good firework display, the launch. Two, space pantomime performances, essentially theatrics to get the naive and gullible to believe the ast astronauts are actually in space after the rocket launch. And then three, the return of the space shuttle, supposedly from an orbit. But myself and many others have highlighted that's more than likely done by space shuttle jets, just returning from an undisclosed location, landing, claiming to have come back from space. And there you have it, space shuttle jets everyone. How would that work though when essentially the space shuttle was just a glider at that point? Once it re-entered Earth's atmosphere the engines were off. It had no jet propulsion at all. It relied on energy that it built up from orbital velocity. However, Level Earth Observer is going to provide proof apparently for his claim. You want proof of that? Check this footage out of the Russian space shuttle Buran taking off and landing Oh my word, I can't quite believe this. In this video you're showing, Level Earth Observer, the shuttle you're seeing there is not the Buran. It is the OK Glee, 
I think that's how you pronounce it, also known as the Buran Aerodynamic Test Vehicle. It's not the orbital Buran that flew in space in 1988. This was a full-scale analogue of the Buran shuttle. Unlike the space-capable orbiter, this shuttle was slightly different. It had four turbojet engines mounted on the back. You can see them in the footage. It was mainly used for landing and handling tests, including real takeoffs and landings from a runway, and never went to space and it wasn't designed to either. How have you fallen for this one? Oh my days, Level Earth Observer, this is embarrassing even for you. I don't think he's gonna recover from this, so I'm gonna say we're gonna wrap this up for another video. Well, there we go. Let me know your thoughts on that Level Earth Observer video there in the comments below, as I say, we're all done and dusted for another one. Thanks so much for watching today. If you enjoyed it, please do consider subscribing to the channel, hitting the thumbs up button too, and sharing as well if the feeling takes you. Thank you. Just enough time to once again thank Incogni for sponsoring today's video. Take your personal data back with Incogni. Use the code at the link below and get 60% off an annual plan. That's at incogni.com slash Simon Dan. I've been Simon Dan. Have yourselves a great day and I'll see you tomorrow where apparently evolution's been debunked again. Of course it has. See you then.